Good morning. Welcome to the worship of God, those of you at home, online, and those of you here in church. Good to see you all here this morning. May the Lord bless us as we worship Him together. Let us worship God in our call to worship, which today is the first three verses of Psalm 18. Let's declare our trust in God as we say these words together. I don't have the words at the back. Andy, can we get the screen on? I've got them here, though. Let's say these words together. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I called to the Lord, who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. Let's praise God together now in our opening hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. It's good to have Dave with us this morning at the organ. Thank you, Dave. If we're able, we stand to sing, keeping our masks on.
Thank you, Dave. There's normally five verses, but we only had four uh, today. Let us pray. Lord God, our loving Heavenly Father, we come into Your presence and we bless You. We call on ourselves in the deepest part of our being all we are to praise You, to love You, to adore You. We praise You for the joy we have in being Your very own people and knowing that we have a place in Your heart. How amazing that is. You love us more than we can ever fully take in. In Your great love, You sent Your only Son to die in our place to save us from our sins, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. Who like us Your praise should sing. We praise Jesus, our risen Lord, who is with us now as we gather in worship. We are happy to be here this morning, Father. Some of us come here today feeling sad or with concerns that weigh us down, yet we still come gladly because You are a God who carries our burdens. You are with us. We can trust You at all times and in all circumstances, not just in happy times, but in sad times as well. So we come and we bless You, Lord. We offer You our sacrifice of praise. We lift up Your name and say that You are the only God over all things. You are worthy of all praise and glory and worship and thanks now and forever. As we come, we ask You to forgive us from all the wrong things we have thought, said, and done that would keep us from You. Thank You for the blood of Jesus that cleanses and goes on cleansing from all sin. Father, please bless us now in our worship. Open our ears and our minds and our hearts to hear what You're saying to us, and may we respond in faith, love, and obedience. We bring our prayers in Jesus' name and continue in the prayer He taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. Ian Landos is now going to bring us our Bible reading. This morning's reading is from Acts chapter 16, verses 19 to 40. When their owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a sudden violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. 
At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release these men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. Amen. Thank you, Ian, for bringing us that reading. Before we come to look further at uh, that uh, passage, we stand, if we're able to sing together, Blessed Be Your Name by Matt Redman.
We come today to the third person uh, Luke tells us about who found faith in Jesus and became part of the brand new church in Philippi in what is now northern Greece. We've met Lydia, the wealthy businesswoman from what is now Turkey. She was a seeker. The Lord opened her heart to respond to the message Paul was bringing about Jesus, and she and her whole household came to faith. Then there was the unnamed slave girl we met last time. She had an evil spirit which enabled her to make things known to people from a source that was not of God. She was in great spiritual, psychological need, bound by that spirit. She was set free by the power of Jesus. And we understand that she found new life in Christ and also became part of the new church. So there's two women, one well off, one poor, one foreign, the other local, one seeking, one in great need. But they found both of them new life in Christ, became part of the church. What diversity there is in the family of church. What binds us together? It's Jesus. We are one in Christ Jesus with all our differences, all our different backgrounds, all to the glory of God. Today we meet a man, and he's from a different background again. He's a Roman, a prison governor. We might say he's middle-class civil servant. We'll see what happens to him in the amazing events before us this morning. Before we meet him, we see Paul and Silas facing, and this is our first heading today, severe opposition. Severe opposition. There's a strong backlash from the owners of the slave girl. They're not happy at all. Uh, the source of income in which they relied, generated by her ability to tell fortunes and all the rest of it, was gone. And that's what they're actually upset about. But when they drag, they drag Paul and Silas into the public square to face the magistrates. When they state their case, it's something different that they say. Uh, they disguise their anger behind false charges. As we often find with people, the presenting issue is not necessarily what's really going on in people's hearts, and that's undoubtedly the case here. They complain. The owners of the girl complain about Paul and Barnabas being Jews who are causing civil unrest by trying to introduce customs which are illegal for Romans to accept or practice. They are very clever. They deliberately play into the latent anti-Semitism of the society, and they make it look as if the Christian teaching that Paul and Silence are bringing is illegal and damaging to social cohesion. Does that sound um, familiar at all? There was a law pre pre preventing Romans practicing a religion not sanctioned by the state, but it seems that as long as this whatever was being practiced didn't undermine the Roman religion with their gods and wasn't politically dangerous or morally undesirable, the authorities didn't normally take any action. In this case, though, the charges stuck, especially because the crowd joined in the opposition to uh, Paul and Silas, which is very relevant too in our society, isn't it? The kind of accusations made against Paul and Silas are still made today. For example, in the country in Southeast Asia, where our mission partners, Sam and Ruth Lee, work, anything that is seen to, to go against social cohesion, uh, like a nail that kind of sticks up, it has to be hammered back down again to keep harmony. So Christians can suffer persecution through fears of traditions and so on being changed as people accept Jesus and come under a new authority, the Lordship of Christ. And closer to home, if our Christian faith causes us to take a stand against developments in our society which appear to have widespread support, or at least are championed by the establishment, what happens? We may very well find ourselves accused of causing a disturbance, of being dangerous, of doing something illegal of being hate-filled and offensive. That is happening to people. There was a preacher arrested 
outside a station in London, handcuffed a 71-year-old preacher, taken away because he was preaching on God making us male and female from Genesis. The truth of the matter here in Philippi was that a poor girl who was oppressed by an evil spirit and exploited by her owners had been set free. It was a wonderful event, a great deliverance. But it hit her owners where it hurt, personally, financially, in their pockets, and their bank accounts, and they didn't like it at all. It undermined what they wanted to do, and therefore they took action against Paul and Silas, and there was a commotion in the public square. But who caused that commotion? It wasn't Paul and Silas. The rightness of what they had done, the rightness of what had happened to that girl, was not affected one bit by the opposition and commotion that followed. Very important we see that. Just because something we do causes difficulty, if it's right and done for the Lord and done in love and in truth, and then unpleasantness arises, it doesn't change the rightness of what was done. May that be an encouragement to us today as we serve the Lord. It doesn't mean we stir up difficulty. Don't misunderstand me. But if difficulties come and we've done the right thing, trust the Lord. Without any investigation or trial, Paul and Silas are stripped and beaten. They are severely flogged with the bundle, bundle of rods that the lictors, the magistrate's attendants, carried with them. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11.25 that he was beaten three times with rods. This was probably the first of those occasions. Their backs would have been lacerated and bleeding, and they were then imprisoned in high-security fashion in an inner cell with their feet fastened in the stocks. The plight of Paul and Silas in this awful experience reminds us of our fellow Christians in different parts of the world who are persecuted for their faith. Here's a recent Barnabas Fund prayer request. Three pastors from Kitchen State, Myanmar, have been arrested for leading prayers for peace in their country, which has been racked with conflict since a military coup on 1st of February. The pastors were detained on the 28th of June in connection with a prayer service they had organized, uh, and they were charged with incitement to cause fear and other offenses, potentially resulting in three years' imprisonment. The pastors are in their 60s and 70s. One has stomach and kidney problems. Another is recovering from a stroke. Pray for strength to survive the rigors of prison, and it will soon be released if that is the Lord's will. It's still happening today around the world. Severe opposition, then worship in the darkness. What a lovely picture this is. What a glorious scene is displayed here. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. They weren't moping and feeling sorry for themselves, so their backs were raw and painful. They were immobilized by their feet in the stocks, and their surroundings were awful. These were realities, but they were praying and singing hymns to God. What an encouragement for us, and what a challenge too. It's been really important, hasn't it, for us to continue worshiping and praying during this whole pandemic. That was very much the case when we could only do that through our online services uh, or by watching songs of praise or whatever at home, joining in singing, praying, and hearing God's Word at home. And it remains very much the case that we, even now we're in person again, that we worship, we praise with hymns and pray, uh, even although we're wearing masks. We don't like wearing masks especially when we're singing. I've got the benefit of not having to. 
uh, wear masks up the front, but I have been at services when I haven't been leading wearing the mask and singing. I know it is not pleasant, but we can still praise the Lord and pray and worship and hear and speak His Word, even with a mask on. Masks are an awful lot better than having a lacerated back and our feet in the stocks as we sit in a dark, dismal prison. Paul and Silas praised the Lord and prayed to Him right in the middle of their pain and suffering and confinement. No wonder the other prisoners were listening to them. Can you picture, them, picture the scene? Can you hear them singing there? Their voices rising in the darkness and out of the pain in that place. What a testimony that singing was to the reality of God in whom they trust. We too need to sing hymns and pray in the darkness. We're singing about that. In the midst of COVID, in the midst of our distress and even our pain, in the midst of a grieving heart, when we can't see the way ahead, when we are distressed and bewildered and feeling very inadequate indeed, we can sing hymns and pray to God. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. We need to be praying and singing praise to God here in Hoyk, a town where a large majority of people seem to have little or no time for God. No one else is going to do it if we don't do it as His people. Only Paul and Silas could do that in that prison that night. Will you join in and make your sacrifice of praise always ongoing, no matter what you're going through, as best you can, even in brokenness and in tears? It can, of course, cost to praise God. It means putting aside our pride of heart and our self-absorption, and that's really challenging, and acknowledging that God is God and deciding to praise Him. It can mean not doing that thing we might otherwise have done on a Sunday morning and going to church instead can mean in the midst of the myriad of other things we feel we simply must do now, stopping and giving ourselves to prayer for a time. It can mean bearing the mockery and criticism of family and friends. But praise and prayer open the door to God doing things. And we see that here in an extraordinary way as we come to our next heading, God's saving power at work. God now does something uh, extraordinary. There's a violent earthquake. You may know the power of earthquakes, devastating power. Last time we saw it on our TV screens was in Haiti. And this earthquake shakes the foundation of the prison, causes all the doors to fly open, and the chains of the prisoners to come loose with the shaking of it all. No one seems to have been harmed. And no one seems to have taken what would normally have been the welcome opportunity to escape. Uh, perhaps as they heard Paul and Silas praying and singing there, uh, and then the earthquake happens immediately, they put the things together and they think something is going on here, and they, they don't escape. So when the, the governor says, decides you better commit suicide because he's going to be held responsible for the prisoners escaping, Paul is able to shout out to him, don't harm yourself. We're all here. No one had escaped. The jailer's under deep conviction of his need before God. What must I do to be saved, he asks. There's no need now for him to fear being punished for prisoners escaping because they're all there safe. So, he's not asking how he can be saved in that sense. He is not a, he is asking to be how he can be right with God. Had he heard Paul and Silas speaking in the town? 
Had he heard the slave girl calling out? Had he been concerned about these men of God being imprisoned unjustly? We don't know. But he has become aware that God is real and that he needs to get sorted out with him. Let's pray that people we know and people around about us and people we come in contact with, people in our families, friends, will come to that realization that God is and will come under conviction that they need Him more than anything else, that they will be saved eternally. They will feel God's hand in them. They'll know this. Pray that for people. We should do that. What must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas give the jailer the most straightforward of answers. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They need to put their trust in Jesus. And that's still the answer today, you know. I do wonder sometimes in the church whether we actually still fully believe that. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Despite all the changes in culture and fashion and thought, all the advances in science and technology and in medical and psychological insights and understanding, the good news of Jesus is still the power of God to save all who will believe. Do you have confidence in the gospel? May God give us all deep confidence in God's power to save all who come and put their trust in Jesus. Cling to Him by faith. He forgives. He makes us right with God. He redeems and transforms our life. He, he makes us increasingly like Himself. He uses us in His service. He gives us eternal life, beginning now and going on through death until we're at home with Him forever. That's quite a promise, isn't it? Quite a reality. Paul and Silas go on to speak further about the Christian faith to the jailer and his family, and we know they come to faith. We hear that later whole family come to faith. And what a lovely picture of the jailer's penitent faith. He tenderly washes their wounds. It's a lovely picture, isn't it? Get a sponge out and washes their backs and puts, I don't know what they would do, put ointment on it and tend them. And Chrysostom, the early church leader, says, the jailer washed and was washed. He washed them from their stripes and he himself was washed from his sins. Right away, he and his family are baptized. Uh, they confess their faith in baptism, and we saw the same thing happen with Lydia and her, her, her household. Let's keep praying for whole families down through the generations to come to faith in Christ. As God works in one person, the Holy Spirit starts to work in the others. They start reading their Bibles. They start thinking about the things of eternity. And they, for themselves, come to faith in Christ, not just because their dad came to faith or whatever. And then, just like Lydia earlier, the jailer gives glad hospitality to Paul and Silas. We can picture the family reclining around the table, full of joy in their newfound faith, it was a feast indeed. What joy! It says they were filled with joy. They would remember that night for the rest of their lives. Here then is a third person and their family that Luke tells us about who became part of the church in Philippi in such a dramatic way. So dramatic that some say oh, that's just made up stories. No, it's not. It actually happened. God's power is the same today. This middle class family we've had a wealthy person, we've had a poor person, now we've got a middle-class family, find the answer to their need of salvation. As the old gospel song says, Christ is the answer to my every need. There's a really important postscript to this incident. You heard it when Ian read it. Let's turn to our final heading, civil law invoked. It seems a bit of a come down after the high drama the night before, doesn't it, to start talking about uh, invoking the civil law. But the magistrates, the magistrates presumably decide that a night in prison with the flogging is probably enough for Paul and Silas, so they send officers to the prison to instruct that they're released. And the jailer says to Paul and Silas, 
Go in peace. It should have been the end of the matter, shouldn't it? No, Paul was having none of it. He levels with the officers. They beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens, and threw us into prison. Now they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. We know that having Roman citizenship, and we know that Paul had it from birth. Silas, it seems, also was a Roman citizen. Having Roman citizenship gave you rights under the law. You weren't allowed just to be beaten without a trial and flogged and put into prison. You were exempted from degrading forms of punishment as a citizen, and you had other valuable rights. So when the magistrates heard, uh, presumably Paul, I don't know whether Paul had tried to explain the night before and hadn't been heard to tell them that they were Roman citizens, but he tells them now, and they're very concerned indeed about what they've done. So what do they do? They come and apologize, and they escort Paul and Silas personally out of the city. Paul and Silas go and encourage the brothers in Lydia's house where the church meets before they go. Perhaps they'd been praying as a church for Paul and Silas during the night. Do you see what Paul courageously did? He invoked the civil law for the sake of the gospel. His stand made it clear to all in authority that a grave injustice had been done, and that would make all the difference to the ongoing work of the gospel in Philippi and elsewhere. We need to be careful about taking matters to, um, to court. Paul in 1 Corinthians cautions Christians very much indeed about taking each other to court. If you have to do that, he says, you've effectively failed in your, relationship, in your relationships. And okay, it doesn't mean we don't do it, but it's, he's saying it's very sad if it has to happen. In all other cases, other means need to be sought first to try to find a just solution, if possible, but there are times when legal action is necessary. And that includes especially when the issue isn't just about us, but is a matter of principle that affects others and affects the gospel and the Christian faith. And that was true here very much. There's been a number of, there have been a number of successful cases along these lines in recent months which should cause us to give thanks for our legal system. One of them concerned Destiny Ministries. I don't know whether it was ever on the BBC News. I'm not sure. But anyway, Destiny Ministries, a network of Christian churches, hired at the beginning of 2020, pre-COVID, the Usher Hall in Edinburgh for their annual three-day conference. But their contract was cancelled when the City of Edinburgh Council received one complaint regarding an invited speaker who held to the traditional biblical view of human sexuality and marriage. The council asked for that speaker to be withdrawn from the conference. The church, church first made a legal representation asking Edinburgh City Council to reconsider the cancellation of the let, pointing out their rights under the Declaration of Human Rights, Human Rights Act, Equality Act. The council declined and wished to uphold what they had done. So the church decided that an important principle was involved, so they took legal action against the City of Edinburgh Council. And in June this year, Facing a full hearing of the case in court later that month, the City of Edinburgh Council apologized to Destiny and offered them £25,000 in damages. They accepted they had discriminated against Destiny under the Equality Act and acted unlawfully under the Human Rights Act. So it didn't go to court, but the, the, the facing up to the possibility of court was enough to make them see the reality of what was going on. There's a contemporary example of what Paul did back then. Isn't it encouraging? It will to some extent help in resisting the current trend of people deplatforming those they disagree with. Just cancel your let. So what an event we've been looking at today. We've seen severe opposition, worship in the darkness, God's saving power gloriously at work, and the civil law invoked. May God encourage and strengthen us through the preaching of His Word.
in response to what we've been hearing, let's sing together, I will call upon the Lord. We saw Paul and Silas singing hymns at midnight. So let's sing, I will call upon the Lord from Psalm 18 again. Um, you will see in the slide, no, we can't probably have it up, but the slide when it comes up, that the, there's a kind of echo of each line. So the men start, start singing, and then when you get to the end of the line, you'll see the words, and the ladies come in there, and then the end of that line, the men come back in again, and so on. Let's see how we get on. I will call upon the Lord. It got slightly out of uh, alignment there, but hopefully you got the idea. Let us pray. Lord God, our Father, we praise you for your mighty power that you rule over all things. It is mysterious to us, but we know it is true, and we trust you. We heard today how in Philippi, all these years ago, you worked in your power to bring the jailer and his family to faith in Jesus and to set your servants, Paul and Silas, free. May we, like them, worship you in the darkness and see the great things you will do. In these continuing COVID days that are so challenging and unsettling, thank you that you are with us in them. Keep us steadily following you all the way through. God, our Father, it was good to have the Tour of Britain cycle race beginning in Hoyt yesterday, bringing the community together out in the streets. We do ask that you will be at work in your grace and power in our town and district. Bring many to the conviction that you are there and that they need you more than anything, and to find in Jesus the answer to their need. And we ask that you will revitalize your church here in reality of faith in Jesus by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord God Almighty, as yesterday was the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and the devastating terrorist attacks that happened in that day, we ask for your continuing comfort for all whose lives were changed so much that day through the loss of loved ones, colleagues, and friends, or through injury, both physical and psychological. Have mercy on them, Lord. Have mercy on us all. We look to you, Lord. Even as evil people perpetrate such atrocities, you see it all and somehow have it all in hand in ways that are beyond our ability to understand. 
We ask that with all that is happening in Afghanistan, you will in your mercy frustrate any plans people may have to engage in violent attacks at this time in the name of their ideology. Lord, as we saw today in Your Word, the power the state has to take action against Your people, but also that they had to apologize at the end. We ask that we will not be afraid of or cowed by the authorities in our nation as we see them in different areas of life moving in directions that are contrary to Your Word, design, and purpose. May we be good and responsible citizens. May we pray and act and speak when we should, speaking out for You, engaging with consultations, exercising our votes wisely, and using the law when appropriate for the sake of Your gospel. May freedom of speech, in particular the freedom to speak Your Word, be preserved and upheld by our government. And now, Lord, we bring before You in the quietness those in our church family, our own family, among our friends and others known to us who are unwell in body or in mind. We name them before You in the quietness, asking You to place Your healing hand on them right now for Your glory and their good. And we think, Lord, of those who have been bereaved. Comfort them, Lord, and speak to their hearts. We bring them to you now. And Lord, we bring to you in the quietness of our hearts our personal concerns, our health, our circumstances, our anger, our pain, our hurt, our sadness, our sin. Whatever it is, Lord, save us, help us, work in us by Your Holy Spirit, we ask. Lord, we bring all our prayers with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. So, our closing hymn is to God be the glory, great things He has done.
Go in peace and with confidence in the Lord to love and serve Him. And now let's say the grace together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever.